Norman, welcome to uh, Longview. You are an American political scientist and a resident scholar at the American Institute, one of the top uh, global thinkers. You diagnosed the American political dysfunction over 10 years ago, and you are a regular uh, at the Global Macro Conference at Spinoza Foundation. So Norm, how, what is your take of the current situation? We're in a, you know, the, the uh, cliched term is uncharted territory. Uh, we haven't seen anything like this, of course, in our lifetimes. Uh, of course, in uh, 2000, uh, we had this uh, election with Bush and Gore that came down to 500 and some votes in Florida that took 36 days to decide that ended up being decided with the Supreme Court intervention on a five to four vote that was along partisan lines. Um, but uh, we got a graceful concession from uh, Al Gore after that, and we moved on. Um, we have grown increasingly not just polarized in the United States, but tribalized since. And the difference is you can have different ideological views, uh, but still find ways to work together and view the other side as partisans, people with misguided attitudes, but we're all trying to solve problems together and we can work it out. Uh, tribalized means the other side are evil and they're trying to destroy our way of life. And while that started in Washington, it has metastasized in the United States to the states uh, and to the public as a whole. Uh, and Donald Trump is a product of that. He didn't cause it. Uh, it was perhaps inevitable uh, given the way the country had been going. And that includes, of course, so many other factors, including the uh, a changing demographic composition of the country, the economic troubles uh, from the uh, 2008 uh, turndown. Um, inevitable that a Trump-like figure might emerge, uh, but Trump has been an accelerant of all of these trends and has chosen an approach to governing that's different from what most presidents have done, not even um, lip service to the idea that I'm going to try and reach out more broadly and be president of the entire country, but working with a base that is pretty consistently around 40% of Americans and trying to excite that base and then suppress the votes of others. Uh, it's not clear that that would be successful this time. It would have been, there's an irony here, Alex. Um, you know, in Australia, we had a prime minister, a conservative prime minister, Scott Morrison, who was very unpopular. And when COVID hit, he followed the advice of the scientists and uh, basically kept the economy moving and did the appropriate shutdowns, the masks, the protective equipment, and uh, had great success. And his approval rating soared. If Donald Trump had done that, I think he would be cruising to re-election right now. Um, that he didn't and that COVID took away the main uh, uh, piece of evidence that he had to win re-election. Look what I've done with the economy. And even though he still has um, a little bit of an edge in the public's view of him on the economy, COVID made that almost impossible for him and has put him in an extremely difficult position and one where the uh, path for him to an election victory is uh, one that creates great divisions, possibly even violence, certainly uh, means uncertainty and trying to delegitimize the results of the election uh, looking ahead. COVID now has also, of course, uh, thrown uh, another uh, great uncertainty into this process with not just the president testing positive, but many key Republicans, including some in the Senate, many in his own White House. I will tell you one of the astonishing things to me is that after his close aide Hope Hicks uh, tested positive, and then the president tested positive, uh, they still have not implemented a mask requirement in the White House itself. We now have at least two or three reporters who've been covering the White House who have tested positive. The press secretary, Kaylee McEnany, just announced it, and she has been meeting regularly in close quarters with reporters without a mask. 
we're likely to see more of this and some of it, including, of course, now the president's campaign manager, Bill Stepien, uh, getting the virus, is close campaign aide and debate uh, organizer Chris Christie in the hospital and probably with the uh, most grim prognosis. And that throws the election itself into a little bit of turmoil. We don't know what will happen with the president on this front. Uh, and we also know that We've got the Supreme Court nomination moving through in an extraordinarily divisive way, a much deeper division uh, along tribal lines in the Senate than I've ever seen before. With only 100 of them, they've tended to be you know, friendly, uh, even if they have deep party differences. These are not going away anytime soon. And the fact is, governing is going to be extraordinarily difficult, even if we get the election result that we most expect, which is a Biden victory, a narrow Democratic margin in the Senate, um, a, a more comfortable margin in the House of Representatives. Uh, and I would add, you know, the challenges of, of governing in the aftermath of all of this, you know, COVID is not going away. And we're probably going to see, and what we've seen in other countries where they managed to bring it under control is a resurgence the requirement in some cases for uh, shutdown and a second time or a third time, it creates a wrenching uh, effect on, on a public and on the economy. It may be many months. Um, we have staggering deficits that have been uh, created through this process. They're gonna get greater because we're gonna have to do even more uh, recovery packages and stimulus packages. Virtually every one of our 50 states has in its own state constitution a balanced budget requirement. The states themselves are going deeply into debt. We have the challenges of the climate, um, which are clearly growing. We've seen these devastating forest fires in California, these wild swings in temperature and storms and elsewhere in the country. If we had everything working perfectly in our system of governance, it would be difficult to resolve some of these challenges. And of course, staggering inequality, we could go on and on. Trying to deal with them with dysfunctional, deeply divided tribal government uh, is gonna be extremely difficult. And it's not just the United States. Uh, you know, We have become in some ways a poster child for uh, dysfunction, but look at the challenges to governance throughout Europe uh, and uh, in many other places and if the global economy is uh, in some turmoil, even places that have dealt with uh, the virus and with the challenges of the last uh, year or two well are going to be hit also. I'm expecting a significant period of uh, unease and um, instability, and that will affect governance uh, in countries across the globe as well. Thank you. That's the good news. <laughs> on, on election night, what are the states, uh, the state we have to monitor, and uh, what are the important signals we have to see from those? So let's start with the fact that uh, Trump won a surprising, narrow victory in 2016, even as he lost the popular vote nationally by about three million, because he broke what was once called the blue wall the states in the Midwest that Democrats had counted on consistently for their election victories. And that was these three states of Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin. He won them all very narrowly. He won them in part because he got a surge in votes from rural and uh, less populated areas, but also because the enthusiasm among Democrats, especially African-Americans uh, to, towards Hillary Clinton was down. And so there was a depressed vote for Democrats in uh, cities of Detroit and Milwaukee, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia. And uh, if he loses those states, it's very unlikely that there's any place where Trump could pick up a victory that would uh, enable him to win. The one exception to that is the neighboring state to uh, uh, Wisconsin of Minnesota, where Trump lost relatively narrowly. He's trying to make a big effort there. That's my home state. It does not appear to be paying off. 
So we're going to be watching those three states to begin with. The most significant is Pennsylvania, and that's in part because you have a Republican legislature that has done what it can to try and suppress those Democratic votes, uh, filing lawsuits to uh, make it difficult, um, and because Pennsylvania has uh, this requirement, which is ridiculous, but it's still there, in a year when we're going to get an enormous number of votes cast by mail because uh, people don't want to turn up at the polls on election day during a pandemic. And there are more Democrats than Republicans, but they can't begin to process or open those votes by mail until election day. And on election day, of course, they're busy uh, with all the people turning out at the polls. So it could take weeks and we will get legal challenges. But along with that, States that Democrats had hoped to win in the past, um, but have failed, uh, failed in 2016, are now uh, on a path towards potential Biden victory there. The most significant one to watch on election eve is Florida. Florida, uh, back in 2016, I remember I was uh, uh, covering the election for BBC and uh, for all of those in New York for election coverage, for all the networks and, uh, and newspapers, there's a kind of a, a lunch that takes place on election day um, with maybe 25 or 30 analysts and pundits. And a Republican from Florida, Mike Murphy, said, uh, Hillary will win this state. We'll know it by eight o'clock. It'll all be over. And when it became clear that uh, we weren't going to know by eight o'clock and that Clinton was likely to lose, that should have been a, a kind of canary in the coal mine indicator that this was a different kind of election. If Biden wins Florida, right now he appears from the polls to be up by two or three points, but we also know he's struggling some with the Hispanic community in terms of the margin of the victory there, and it's a huge part of the state. But there they count the absentee votes or at least process them very early on. If we find out on election eve that Biden is likely to win Florida or if he's projected as a winner, um, that would balance Pennsylvania off and it would make it far more likely that we know there'll be a Biden victory, not on election eve, most likely, but within a couple of weeks thereafter. Arizona is a state that's been solidly Republican but with a very large Hispanic population, many of them, uh, and a lot of them, of course, Mexican-Americans, uh, very much turned off by Trump's nativist approach. But also uh, John McCain's widow, Cindy McCain, and McCain, of course, was an extremely popular figure in Arizona. Uh, she has endorsed Joe Biden. The former Republican senator from Arizona, Jeff Flake, uh, has endorsed uh, Biden. And Flake is a Mormon. There is a sizable Mormon population in Arizona. And uh, we expect a high turnout there. Uh, that's a potential turnover for Biden as well. He has to worry a little bit about Nevada. That's the one state where there's a tiny possibility that it could go from a Democratic uh, victory for Clinton to uh, a victory for Trump, but very unlikely at this point. Uh, and we can also look at uh, states like North Carolina, Georgia, even Ohio and uh, Iowa. Uh, Ohio with a large suburban population and the uh, college educated suburban voters, many of whom have been Republican, went for Trump in 2016, have been turned off by his rhetoric and divisiveness. And Iowa, where farmers have been heavily hit uh, by the trade uh, uh, wars and the struggles in the economy um, where uh, the uh, meatpacking plants, there's a big industry there, have been devastated by COVID. Uh, it's possible that Biden could win a very comfortable victory, but it's just as possible that we aren't going to know the results of the election for several weeks after November 3rd. If, if Trump wins the election again and we have a rerun of 2016 where he loses uh, popular vote, do you think we can have a constitutional crisis? I do think there's a strong possibility of a constitutional crisis. And if Trump uh, were to win a narrow electoral college victory um, legitimately, 
he's likely to lose the popular vote by six million or more this time. Uh, and there are going to be an awful lot of Americans who think that the system is simply rigged, that it's supposed to be a democracy where voters choose their president. And that would be, I think, extremely difficult. Now, it's not that we'll have a constitutional convention, but it would be um, a very deeply divisive thing. And of course, a Trump victory, I think, would mean steps further along the way towards a kind of regime in the United States that would be more like uh, Erdogan's in Turkey or Sisi's in uh, Egypt than it would be like what we're used to in uh, European or other uh, Western democracies. But remember, we could have something else, which is a contest in the election that would take it to December or January, very possibly, and Trump has openly talked about this, the Supreme Court intervening again with a new justice viewed as illegitimate by a large share of the population, uh, jammed through right before the election, and if not by uh, a House of Representatives with a majority of Democrats, but which would select a president if there were a dispute by states. And because Republicans do well in the small, uh, sparsely populated states, and every state gets at least one representative, Republicans right now have a majority uh, in the state delegations. 26 out of 50. If we got a president selected that way, even if in the narrowest terms it's legitimate, it would be widely viewed as uh, stealing the election and I think would result in a, a, a very bad situation. So where, so where do you see the American democracy is going to? I think the next number of years is going to be um, a, a real challenge, a challenge in governance. Um, it's a challenge, as I said earlier, that would be there because of the difficulty of dealing with some of these existential issues for the planet, like the climate. But also, you know, the trade, uh, the global trade architecture was in trouble before Trump came along. We have to find a new and better way of dealing with trade. We still have lots of challenges around the globe. Um, Keep in mind that in this election, we're still worried about what role Russia is going to play. And we have uh, major figures in our intelligence world who say that Russia is trying even harder to influence the course of the election. But even with uh, if they don't succeed on that front, they're a force to be reckoned with out there. We've got turmoil, of course, uh, throughout the Middle East and elsewhere. The challenge for America and the world is a bigger one. The challenge that's there because we have been viewed widely in many places through the Trump years as having lost our ability to influence events, as being more a laughingstock than a model for the rest of the world, we have to rebuild that. But internally, th this tribal division is not going away. And whether Joe Biden, if he is elected president, can somehow find a way better than Barack Obama did to reach out to working class, non-college educated white Americans who fear that they're losing their position of significance in the society. In a world where, remember, what COVID is going to bring us is um, great challenges to the economy. Many of our small businesses and restaurants are not going to be able to survive, and it's not at all clear that they'll be able to rebuild and come back in the aftermath. Uh, just to pick one other example, uh, We've had a boom in commercial office space and building in the Washington, D.C. area, and that's been true in many places in the world. We still have buildings being put up. But firms, whether it's law firms or accounting firms or others, uh, have told their employees to go home and work from home through the course of the last eight months. Uh, many of them are not going to go back to wanting the same kind of office arrangement that they've had in the past. We're going to have vacancies in these buildings. We're going to have bankruptcies of companies that have leverage to build new office space. Uh, we're going to have leases that will run out and not be renewed. Many of the pension funds, not just the American ones, but global pension funds are heavily invested in these commercial real estate operations. Who knows what the implications of all of those things will be? What jobs will replace the ones that are not going to be coming back because of these small businesses? Will other businesses emerge? 
we've got a lot of issues out there and we're going to have a deeply divided political system. If Republicans lose everything, their model for winning back in a midterm election is to try to delegitimize everything the majority is doing. And that worked in 2010 in the midterms when Democrats had had uh, control over everything and they lost the House in a huge uh, election defeat. And then they lost the Senate in 2014 when the same strategy was pursued. I cannot imagine that Republicans are going to abandon that approach. And if they somehow come back and win significant numbers, including maybe winning back a majority of the House or Senate in 2022, we're back to the same kind of uh, gridlock and divisiveness. It's hard for me to imagine a bright uh, period ahead over the next five years. I can imagine one where we start to recapture some of our sense of identity as a democracy, where Biden is able to move with the numbers that he has to do a stimulus, to begin to get an economic recovery, to stabilize our healthcare system, to rebuild our alliances. Lots of good things can happen. Rejoin the Paris Accords and maybe really make a major move towards uh, green energy. That would be a, a model for some of the rest of the world, perhaps. Um, but I'm you know, not sanguine that we're gonna be on a very good path, uh, no matter what, uh, at least for the next four years. Norman, that was fascinating. Thank you very much. And sure. thank you to our attendees. Thank you. Uh, my pleasure, Alex, always. Thank you. Bye-bye.